Hi, everyone. Speaking of gratitude, thank you, Vincent. That was a fantastic presentation. And uh, I, I'm also very grateful to, do, to do, Dr. Robin Chutkin, who is not here. I've never met her, but she's a pioneer in this field. And I would encourage everyone to go uh, watch her YouTube videos about rewilding your gut. So I think she invented that term, although I'm not sure, but just search uh, rewilding your gut and she'll give you lots and lots of tips about how to introduce the, the lost members of, the, of your gut microbiome uh, back inside your gut. So thank you for the introduction, Glenda. So um, I want to point out some things. Uh, I actually made this slide just uh, 20 minutes ago in response to some of the previous talks and something that's out there. What I want to highlight here is that you're not the average human. And every time you read anything about any study, that is the average human. And there's not a single person in this room that is that average human. So just think about that when you read a study, does that really apply to you? And we at our company have data to show that it does not apply to any one human. It's a nice graph, it shows trends and risks and it can be useful, but it doesn't really apply to you. And so, <clears throat> None of us are average. So, for example, Max talked this morning about how eggs are great for you. Eggs are great for some people, but for others, eggs carry, carry lecithin. If you have the gut microbiome members that process that lecithin into TMA, and it gets into your body, it gets converted to TMAO, it's one of the most powerful promoters of heart disease. And so, eggs are not good for everyone. So please take that into consideration. Spinach. We have more than 50,000 customers whose stool samples we've analyzed. Almost 50% of those customers, spinach is toxic to them because spinach has oxalates, research it. Spinach has oxalates, high levels of oxalates. Those are, if they're not converted by the gut microbiome, if they're not consumed, they will enter your body and cause kidney stones and no one wants that. And so all of these studies, when you hear one day coffee is great for you and then you're like, awesome. You go drink lots of coffee, and then a month later, whoops, coffee is not good for you. It's because the, the, the group of people that they chose for each one of those study, the average of that group that they chose responded in such a way. Everyone, every person in that study responded differently. And so please take that into consideration. Look at this biologic drugs. So biologic drugs are used to treat autoimmune diseases. They're the most expensive drugs on the market very powerful modifiers of the immune system. They're, they cost twenty to $40,000 a year, and they are miraculous for some people. But for others, they cause way more problems than the initial problem that, that caused the prescription of these drugs. And so when you hear all those commercials on TV, take that seriously. Look at the side effects of these drugs. Someone who's never had Crohn's disease in their entire life takes one biologic because their joints hurt, and then they develop Crohn's disease three days later and then they have it as long as they're taking them. And then as soon as they withdraw the drug, they go back to normal. So when they, anything that anyone says this works, it works for an average person. You're not the average. And so that's really what my talk is about. It's precision nutrition. Um, another context I wanna give is uh, Hadza tribe, for example, or, or some other tribes or the blue zones in, in Greece and Japan. You do not have their lifestyle. You wake up first thing in the morning and you're gonna, get stressed and, and, and hurry up and hit the traffic and go to work and deal with, with people at work and then be in traffic again. Those people in, in a Greek village, if you've never been to a blue zone, they have never experienced that, okay? Never in their 90 years. I've spoken with them and when I speak to a 96 year old Greek, they, are, they don't look any older than 60 and they're crisp, right? But they've never had a stressful moment in their life. So please don't say, oh, I'm gonna eat Mediterranean diet and I'm gonna be like them. That's not gonna happen. Your lives are very different, profoundly different. Okay, so there is no one diet and lifestyle that is good for everyone. That, that we have data to prove that and I will show you some of those data today. And everyone needs personalized nutrition and lifestyle, everyone. And that's what my company is about and that's uh, my entire scientific career, I worked very hard to develop the technologies that enable the company that I'm currently running, and then I left the scientific field and started the company, and that's what we're doing now. So what is my goal and the goal of my company? It's not to make money, it's not to go public, it's not to become famous, none of those things. It's to develop machine-learned algorithms, these are objective algorithms, for personalized nutrition 
that prevents and treats chronic diseases. And I will show you an example of that that uh, every customer today of Viome can use such that when we analyze someone's stool sample and the lab staff says this sample passes quality control, 100% of the work that takes from that molecular data to someone being told what to eat and what not to eat is done by machines, 100%. It's not 99.9 .9 or 99.99. .99. It is 100% mathematical algorithms, and they're based on massive amounts of data. And so that's exactly what we need. We don't need an advice from a nutritionist. We don't need an advice from some, someone with anecdotal experience. We need mathematical algorithms, and that's what we're trying to bring on. Please don't, don't, don't think that we have a formula for everything. We do not. We're just starting out. The revolution has started, but there's a lot more work to do. So here's my story that drove this whole thing. So at 25, I, I, I started experiencing autoimmune disease, which is rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis and carpal tunnel syndrome. And I, by the time I was 40, the, the most that modern medicine could do is paint my leaves green. Thank you very much for that. That was awesome, right? So I took years of NSAIDs. I was, I was taking drugs that may be, may be incontinent, right? To treat my rheumatoid arthritis, they give me a drug that makes me pee uncontrollably, and I have to wear diapers from the time I'm 37 until I die. How ridiculous is that? That is absolutely the most ridiculous thing to accept that. I, I was absolutely not willing to accept that. Well, after two days. Um, <laughs> So <laughs> I didn't realize how bad it was going to be. So I was headed for a hip replacement. My right hip was walking up, right, at the age of 40. And they said, well, you can be in a wheelchair or you can get your hips replaced. And so all I did is I read one study. I made one profound diet change. And not only did my disease stop, it completely reversed and I completely healed myself, completely. This is a medical miracle. I've worked now with many rheumatologists. I currently am setting up some very large trials on autoimmune diseases, and I'm working with one of the leading rheumatologists in the country. Every single doctor says, what has happened to you is medically impossible. The only thing that drugs can do is slow down your disease. They can delay the symptoms. They cannot cure it. And I made one diet switch, and that's what happened. Okay, so now let's talk about Max's presentation. So Max recommends beef, right? I ate a ketogenic diet in the fall of 2014. I lost my ability to memorize things in those three months. And that hasn't fully recovered yet. Now, I have friends who have been on keto diet for five years, and they, they love it. Love it, love it, love it. Okay? So when someone says ketogenic diet is great, or a Mediterranean diet is great, or this diet is great, there are now over 1,000 diets. They are all wrong, 100% because there is no one diet that's good for everyone. It just does not exist. And so um, let's keep going. So this is sort of a philosophical thing, but you know, academics unfortunately study small populations. You're not going to learn how to help seven billion people by studying 10 people. And that's why we have this conflicting research. One day something's good, one day something's bad, right? The same thing is bad, it's hard to tell. Big Pharma has no interest in these pre prevention. They don't want to teach you how to fish. They want to sell you fish for the rest of your life. And so this is, where, this is what, what sparked me to start our company. And look at the stats from CDC. 60% of US adults have a chronic disease. That is, a, that is an epidemic that is simply now accepted as sort of, well, that's how it is. But now we have the technology to solve all this problem, and we're running as fast as we can at Viome to actually address the root cause of of these diseases and not to just uh, paint the leaves green. So let's talk about the gut-brain connection. So the gut microbiome produces neurotransmitters. Those are listed. It regulates the immune system. 70% of the immune system is lining the gut. It, they're not, it's not in the blood. The vagus nerve that Vincent told us about, I'll touch upon it. And then the brain controls intestinal motility. It secretes, it induces secreting of all kinds of molecules that regulate our gut microbiome. And it also, uh, induces immune response. This is that vagus nerve that Vincent mentioned. There are 100 to 500 million neurons. I mean, that's a staggering number. 100 to 500 million neurons lining our gut. And we don't know what they do. We know some things, but we know very, very little. So there's so much more to be discovered. I'll now give you some literature references. So, Gut microbiome is able to stimulate serotonin production in our gut lining, so that's pretty cool. 
gut microbe, microbes can consume GABA, and so that which, we, which GABA has a calming effect. Gut microbiome and autism, you guys should all read this paper. This was led by, by two professors at um, Arizona State University. They simply transferred poop from healthy children to children with autism. That's all they did. And this is literally a medical miracle. There is, no, there is no doctor in the world that can actually achieve anything similar to this. After two years, they followed up this, these children, and they, they, their autism was reduced by 50%. This is simply a miracle, and all they did is transferred poop, nothing else. So we don't understand yet exactly the mechanism of that, and the FDA may slow things down, but they're trying hard, and we're trying to help them. So gut microbiome and epilepsy, Vincent mentioned that it's been observed that ketogenic diet can actually reduce or eliminate ep epilepsy. And um, now there are a couple of companies, and this particular research project here showed that it's specific microbes that are responsible for this effect. And now there are companies that are trying to bring up probiotics that can actually treat epilepsy. So imagine just swallowing a pill with two bacterial species in there, and your epilepsy is completely gone. That would be wonderful. Gut and oral microbiome and, and Alzheimer's, so both have been um, associated with Alzheimer's. There's a particular microbacteria, micro, uh, microbe that, that's called porph Porphyromornis gingivalis that has been found in the lesions of the brain that cause Alzheimer's, and that's in, that, that microbe lives in our mouth. So it's very possible, this is my hypothesis, so it's not found anywhere else, it's very possible that this microorganism, due to inflammation, can cross into the bloodstream from our gums, and then due to Again, inflammation, our blood-brain barrier becomes leaky, and those microbes can actually enter the brain where the innate immune system in the brain actually swallows them and encapsulates them into these lesions. And so that could be the cause of Alzheimer's. So it could be that simple, basically. It's the combination of a, a microbe crossing from the gums to the blood and then inflammation, systemic inflammation causing a um, blood-brain barrier inflammation that, that allows this microbe to enter the, the CNS so we don't know yet, it's just a hypothesis, there's others as well. Parkinson's disease, it's now been essentially proven that the gut microbiome plays a, a critical role in the onset of uh, Parkinson's disease, and it's a very complex role. If you see here, I've listed three studies. Gut microbiome may cause Parkinson's disease, but it also in treatment of, uh, of, of, the, of the disease, we currently use levodopa therapy, and gut microbiome was just recently shown to consume that drug. And so when people are given this drug, they have various responses against the, again, the average response is good, but that varies from great response to no response. And it's been shown now that the gut microbiome is responsible for the variability in those responses. So we may be able to have a gut microbiome test that tells the doctor exactly what the dosing should be for this Parkinson's drug and, and make it much more effective. Gut microbiome and multiple sclerosis, um, it's, there, there are such strong connections that there's almost no doubt that that's what it is. So let's, let's talk about depression. So the most prevalent disease in the world, great, more than 300 million people worldwide have it, and 80% of those people, people's lives are affected in some sort of way. Drugs work, but with major drawbacks. You can go and read about the side effects of the drugs and the, the difficulty with switching from drug to drug. So... <clears throat> Um, sorry, Dennis, I'm going to show this study. So this study basically shows that all of the genetic determinants connected where people have identified different genes associated with depression, that that's likely false discovery, which means that those genes are not truly connected with depression. And the jury is still out, but what really helps with depression is diet. And so this was a SMILES trial out of Deakin University in Australia, and we've been now working with, with this group since they published the paper, and they showed that their modified Mediterranean diet can actually reduce clinical symptoms of depression. And so, again, on average it worked well, but some people responded really well, others did not respond. And so we are now building machine-learned models or algorithms that can tell every single person exactly to how, what, to, what to eat and what not to eat so that their depression is going to be lowered. We haven't demonstrated that it works, and so we don't know. But anecdotally, we see great results. Look at this study. Simple fecal microbiome transplant. You take poop from a healthy person, put it in, inside a person with depression, and it treats depression. Nothing else. That's amazing. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about now what we are doing at Viome and how we're trying to address these problems. So this is technical, but I'll try to present it in a way that everyone can understand it. So on this slide, this is sort of the way we think of the human body. The human body is, we bring in nutrition, and when we think about nutrition, we th our computers don't think in terms of wheat and, and rice. They think in terms of what are the molecules that are there. You all have heard about carbs, fats, and proteins. Well, there's thousands of different kinds of carbs and thousands of different kinds of fats. And so not all of them have good effects on everyone and not all of them have bad effects on everyone. And so nutrition is far, far more complex than just wheat and rice. Then we go into the gut microbiome, and so our gut microbiome test is the only one in the world that can not only identify every single microbe that lives inside of someone's large intestine, but also very, very importantly, in fact, more importantly, we can see what those microbes are doing because you, you should think about the gut microbiome not as a collection of microorganisms, but as a very large chemical factory. So when you consume food and it hits the large intestine, this, these microbes, immediately jump on that food and they're seeing that food as their food and they're gonna process that food chemically to extract energy from that food. And so when they convert that food into their poop, micro poop, that poop is actually what enters your bloodstream and regulates your physiology. And so the chemical reactions performed by the gut microbiome is what we assess and those are far more important than who is there. Because if vitamin K comes into my bloodstream and my, my body is happy about it, I don't care whether it came from coprococcus something or bifidobacter something. That doesn't matter. Those are made up name by human, names by humans that makes no influence on my physiology what we named some microorganism. On the human side, we're measuring the human immune system. Uh, this was just touched upon a little bit, but I can tell you that this IgG, the immune response to different foods, has been life-changing for several people, including me. Life-changing. And then human metabolism, we're measuring with a simple blood test that we're gonna come out soon. And then the clinical status is very important. That's a little bit of a technical mumbo jumbo. Okay, let's talk about machine learning. This is sort of the hottest thing on the planet right now. But if you give it, give it lots of data and ask it to learn something, it's gonna learn completely meaning, meaningless information. And so you have to be very careful. Just because something is machine learned, it doesn't mean it's meaningless, meaningful at all because machines don't know that it, what it means. So we have a system that we follow at Viome, which means produce good data, high quality data, develop the models, validate the models, revalidate the models, and then test the models. Okay, so this is the Viome platform. We basically think of food as molecules. We think of microbes as a chemical factory, and we measure the activities of those, of those, of those pieces of factories. And then we associate the output of those factories with disease and health in our clinical trials and clinical studies. And so this is sort of our principle of how we approach things. I can just give you a, a couple of examples. If a person has a, a gut microbiome that will take something found in wheat and make a pro-inflammatory biochemical, our computer will take wheat and put it in the minimize list. If a person has a micro, microbiome that will take uh, something like eggs into something beneficial, uh, an anti-inflammatory or to, to support your immune system, then eggs will be put in the maximize list, right? And the indo enjoy and indulge. So these are all mathematical algorithms that take into account this. So um, we've developed lots of these machine learned algorithms. This is a, t a lot of technical mumbo jumbo, but um, we, we now have um, large clinical studies greater than 950 participants each. And we have predictive machine learned models for IBS, type 2 diabetes and obesity. So um, we're now using these models to develop personalized diets. I'll give you one specific example that has gone from an idea to now our customers actually benefit from this machine learned algorithm right in the app, okay? So glycemic index. I think everyone knows about the glycemic index. It tells you, if you look at this table on Google, it tells you how high your sugar will go if you eat one of these foods. Is this personalized glycemic index? Does it say anywhere in there personalized? It's not. It's for that average human. I'm willing to bet that there's not a single person in this room that this glycemic index applies to. In fact, we have lots of data to show that there isn't any, anyone. So this is really an academic exercise, okay? 
And so what my wife and I observed early on is that if we eat the same portion of potatoes relative to our body weight, that our glycemic response is completely the opposite. And if we eat quinoa, it's very different. If we eat wheat, it's very different. And we've done this now many, many times with hundreds of people. And so if you, if you want to eat carbohydrate-rich foods, which I need to eat, um, if you want to eat carbohydrate-rich foods and you want to have your blood sugar be the lowest and follow this, you could be making completely wrong choices because this is for the average human and you're not one of those. And so here I'm showing you on the left side of this slide, we purchased these foods and we gave them to two different people. And you can see the glycemic response for the banana and the sprouted grain bread is opposite in two different people, completely opposite, right? And so um, we created a very large study, 550 people, and you can see here on the right side the meal plan. We designed a meal plan for them with 104 different meals that a human would consume. And so look at the staggering stats here on the left side. 550 participants. Everyone donated a stool sample right before they started the study. And then for the next 14 days, they consumed foods that we either gave them or that they chose, but they had to take a picture of it and input exactly what they ate. And so we fed the machines 18,000 provided meals, 9,000 participant chosen meals, and we gave the machines the results of their glycemic response to every single one of those 27,000 meals, right? And the machines now developed an algorithm that is 80 to 90% accurate in predicting what is the glycemic response going to be to a meal for you based on our gut microbiome test. Not for someone else, not for your spouse, because my glycemic response is different than my spouse. That's why we eat differently. Um, so this 90% accuracy is really the key point because that is the theoretical maximum that we can reach. Meaning that if you as the same person eats the same meal on two different days, there's going to be 10% variability in the glycemic response. And so the best we can possibly do is 90% accuracy. And we're there. So that means now you don't have to guess are potatoes good for you, or is wheat good for you, is rice good for you, is quinoa good for you. The app tells you. So look at the example right here. Uh, I picked a person who is the opposite of me. They're told for couscous, it, it's put on the avoid list, meaning don't eat it. And the reason is because you have a this person has a high glycemic response to couscous and try substituting with quinoa instead. For me, it's exactly the opposite. When I go to quinoa, it says avoid it but eat couscous because that's good for you, right? And it says right on the app. You don't have to guess. This is a machine learned model. There is no nutritionist. There's no doctor. There's nothing. Mathematical algorithms applied to molecular data. And so this is hyper exciting to wake up every day and to work on this where we're going from, well, in my experience, people who I gave this Atkins diet, they did better. There's no experience here. This is mathematical equations applied to chemistry of the gut microbiome that we measure. It's so awesome. Okay, last slide is Los Alamos, New Mexico. If you haven't heard of it or have been there, this is a picture of Los Alamos looking from west to east. We're at 7,200 feet. Not impressive for Aspen people, of course, but, um, but look at the mountains in the back. And uh, that's the setting where Viome was created. Now we're a global company. We have operations, we have offices in six cities, and we have 170 employees, and we're shipping our products globally, and we're expanding. So that's that. Thank you very much.